Hey, what's up folks? Welcome back to another Layer by Layer. In today's tutorial, we're going to take a look at the cat assembly of our zoetrope. So take a look at the Adafruit Learn system and check out our zoetrope project. This is a really cool uh, zoetrope inspired project that uses the Adafruit Cricut to drive a motor and a NeoPixel and a photo interrupter sensor to create this really cool edgelet acrylic animation. So you have like this turntable thing and you have these acrylic panels with some uh, artwork that's engraved on it. Each engraving is a frame from an animation. In this case, it's the party pair animation. And I just wanted to chat about uh, the CAD assembly and um, show you folks how I used um, the GF gear generator in Fusion 360 to make uh, this kind of cool turntable. Uh, so yeah, so check out the, the guide on the Adafruit Learn system. And if you are interested in creating robotic projects or anything motorized, I definitely recommend checking out the Adafruit Cricut. This is the feather wing version. It lets you uh, slap one of these Adafruit feathers on top of this Cricut board, and the Cricut gives you access to driving all sorts of motors, uh, stepper motors, regular DC motors, um, and even, uh, I think I said stepper motors, <laughs> all sorts of types of motors, servos, um, and um, digital inputs so you can do sensors, cap touch, NeoPixel driver, audio amplifier built in. It's all the things you need to make like a visual cool project. And that's why it made sense to use it in this project where we are driving a NeoPixel, a motor, and we're taking data from a sensor, which is that photo interrupter. So check that out. Uh, sign up to get notified when they are back in stock or go ahead and purchase it from DigiKey. I think they have it in stock there. But yeah, very, very cool uh, board for doing robotics and other type of projects. All right, so let me t show you folks uh, the, the gear mechanism that's going on here. So this is a way to create kind of a turntable with a internal gear and a, a double helical, helical gear. And this is not using any ball bearings. It's just using a motor and these two gears. Uh, so there's no ball bearings. Um, there's a couple screws and things, but it's really cool to get this um, vertically mounted up or down and the only thing holding it in place is the gear. Um, there's a little internal ring that kind of keeps it up. Um, but other than that, there's very little friction and it's a cool way to kind of create this uh, moving turntable. And that's kind of the essential thing in this project. Another cool thing that I thought was really neat is that the internal gear is removable from the top cover. So the idea is that the top cover is what holds those acrylic panels so if you wanted to do a different animation, you could just print out a different set of slotted holes and then just fit that internal gear back in there. So that's kind of cool. And here's a look at the inner ring. It's, it has a little groove and the top cover has a lip and those two just mate. And the internal channel is what keeps the turntable in place and from flying off of the assembly. Um, so that's kind of how you install it. And again, in motion, um, when you turn it on, um, it keeps itself upright because of the lip and the internal groove for very little friction and um, because it's a the, the, the profile of the gear is, is a helical double helical um, It's able to kind of self-correct itself and stay centered and um, Here you can see it uh, positioned vertically and it, it's able to maintain its balance and all that uh, Because the gears are meshing really well to each other um, so yeah, that is the thing in motion. So now I'll jump into the CAD assembly and we can chat about some stuff in Fusion 360. So I'll talk about the structure. This is a big project where the goal of it, I really wanted to create all of the main pieces outside of the assembly and then bring everything in together. So this is my first attempt where I'm like designing the pieces individually and then bringing them all together in this main assembly file. And it was working out pretty good up until I started creating the encoder ring where I kind of broke my own rule and I just started designing inside of it. So all of this stuff here in the timeline pertained to that one component. And I really wish I had built it externally and then brought it in because that would have made the time a little bit smaller. Another thing that's crazy is like the, the, the hardware, like the screws and the hex nuts, like they take up a lot of of the timeline. So if you look down here, it, this thing starts about right here. And then all of this stuff is just adding screws and then applying a joint to that screw. 
So that's me. That's kind of what I typically see when I I, I look at other uh, engineers that are making big projects. Their their assembly is just like a bunch of imported things in their timeline. There's nothing actually designed in that, and that's kind of how it, these type of big projects need to be. So. Moving forward, I will try to uh, do everything in its, its in its own component, and then the mass the the main assembly will bring in all those components in. So you can see in my um, in my data panel, I created a a folder just for this project called Zoetrope, and then I tried to build everything in here. So like the gear, the top cover, and everything are are, are built independently, except for of course the uh, the ring, which I was telling you about. I built it in here, and the main reason was because I just got lazy and I, I got tired of dealing with uh, edit in place. So edit in place is the next thing I want to talk about. So edit in place is when you bring in an external component, now you have the ability to, um, to edit in place. You can see this little pencil icon. That little pencil icon lets you edit your component inside of this assembly. So within there, there's a new kind of thing that I've, I'm starting to learn about. It's called assembly contexts. I have four of them, right? And they lay, they kind of safe net name themselves uh, numerically. So you have uh, context one, two, three, four, and then you have something called local. So when you're editing something in place, you kind of sometimes you want to reference the things outside. So you can see here everything that's ghosted is a external component that is not inside of the component you're editing. When you're done editing, you click this finish edit in place. And I started to notice that the associative uh, menu is here. If you don't want to create an associative link, you can you can choose whether you want to uh, have this or not. I just leave it on by default. You know, I think it's a, it's fine to keep this here. It hasn't messed with we messed with me yet. But let me step through them just to give you an idea of what of these context assemblies do. So if I go to the first one, take a look at. What happened around me, what I think is what is going on is that I am now viewing what it looked like when I was editing it before I did all these things outside of this component. So every time you're saving and editing in place, Fusion is keeping track of the contextual assembly, what's going on on the outside. So as I'm flipping through this, you can see the progression outside of this component that I'm editing how everything is changing. And this is just a good way to reference like, oh, I need to move this over there because this component over here is starting to crash into it. So that's why these are here and they're kind of neat. Um, but one of the tips I found that if you're like, a lot of times I'll be editing and I can't quite see what I want because these things are in my way. And even though they're transparent and ghosted out, it's still kind of hard to get in there and see what's going on. So what you could do is you can uh, highlight and activate the local assembly context and that'll just kind of isolate your component. So that's my main tip when you're editing uh, something in place and you're getting confused, uh, getting uh, clearing everything out and then just kind of seeing what it is I'm editing, just click and activate local and that will uh, isolate your component essentially. But if you are having to you know, reference the things outside of what you're editing, then uh, activating the latest context uh, is the way to go. These also get saved in your timeline, which is interesting. Not in this particular timeline, but you'll see once I hit it, once I finish editing in place, it'll bring me back to the main assembly. And uh, you can see here that uh, in the timeline, there are some of these bits here that get saved. Uh, so this is a, a this is where the first context was was built. So as you're editing in place, those are being kind of saved as a snapshot in your timeline of your main assembly. It gets pretty hairy. Um, I'm still, you know, this is the first project where I've used it. So that's why I'm like stumbling with words, trying to explain what the hell it's doing. But essentially it's that you can uh, edit your thing, your, your component in place, and you have the control uh, whether you want to isolate it or see it in context of your assembly. Oh man, it's so hard to, to do, but yeah. Um, that's probably one of the reasons why I designed the encoder ring inside of this document as opposed to doing it in an external document. Ha ha. <laughs> All right, but uh, to go with that, I wanted to chat about how I was able to uh, figure out how to get these two gears to mesh with each other and how to position them in a way where it makes sense. So 
Um, the way I was able to do it was uh, through the bottom cover. So I'll activate that. And basically just figuring out the mounting holes for the, for the DC gear here. And then uh, placing that with a sketch, uh, placing the holes through a sketch. Um, you can see my profile here has uh, these screws or these mounting holes. And I have a sketch dimension that defines like where it is uh, in the center origin. So here I, you can see it's 8.5 millimeters. And that's the position of the mounting holes from the center origin. So if I wanted this to come closer, let's change this to seven. You'll notice that like the feature updates, but nothing else updated. And that's because um, the joint is created on the external component. So what I have to do is I have to fit, hit finish edit in place. And now you can see that the joints have all self-corrected itself and the motor has shifted where it needs to and so has the gear has shifted where it needs to. So you really, you have three joints here that you're working with. You have the joint for the actual motor that gets positioned to the bottom cover, and then you have the joint for the gear that gets positioned to the shaft of the motor. And whenever you change the dimension or the sketch position of your set of mounting holes, everything else will cascade and work with it. Um, now, because it is uh, because the sketch is done inside of an external component, I have to kind of edit in place every time I want to uh, to modify it. So, using a cross section analysis, I can see excuse me where the where the gear is, and you can see here this is way too far. These gears aren't mating, so um, I would have to go back in here, hit edit in place. Double click the sketch I want to update and hit 8.5 just to get it back going. And then it's not updating, you know, because I have to actually hit finish, edit in place. And then the joint for the motor will update and the joint for the gear will update as well. And that's kind of where it is. You'll see it's still not meshing right. And that's because I, I kind of I kind of just faked it. Um, you can't I know this works because I printed it. But if I wanted to make it really, really work, I'd have to go in here where the joint was, right click, drive joint. And then I can drive this manually to see like, oh, okay. So around there is where uh, the gear would work probably okay. Um, yeah, but you can see here, I have about a millimeter of clearance between uh, the surfaces that would essentially mate. So there's about 0.9 millimeters of clearance or really a millimeter, um, yeah. And you can see here that I actually have the, the gear in the wrong orientation. It's actually supposed to be flipped. But again, I, I'm just kind of, I know it'll work because like you can kind of get an idea of how close these are by just doing that cross-section analysis. Um, but yeah, you can, uh, that's how I'm able to, it's a little bit finicky uh, to have to edit in place, hit finish, and then kind of watch it. But um, I think next time, if I were to do this, I would, I would, uh, I would know that I need to have the motor and the gear and the bottom cover all in the same component. That way, when I'm modifying that one component, I don't have to keep hitting finish edit in place to see my joints update. So if I had, if I thought about it a little bit more, I could have made it a little bit more cleaner. Um, but that is the main thing uh, that kind of makes this thing work is how do you get your gears in the right position? And as long as you know you have a working mounting holes for your uh, motor, you should be good. So that's kind of how that's working. Uh, yeah. The next thing is how did you create these gears, right? So these gears are all generated with a plugin. So there's plugins for Fusion 360 and this one's called the GF Gear Generator. So you can download this for Mac or Windows. It's a free download and you can add it. Um, one of the things, uh, that I like about it is that when you are creating a gear, you can't go back into the gear to modify the settings because it's kind of a it's a bit of a script that just executes your your hard coded values and that's it. You can't modify it again. Um, so I mean, you do have a timeline, and I guess you could modify it here, like you can modify the the pattern or the sweep. But what's interesting is this: um, when you generate it, you get this sketch. And this, this sketch gives you the values that were used to create 
the, the gear. So let me show you when I'm creating a gear, uh, the, uh, the plugin shows up under the utilities tab and there's where you can either create the gear or use the drop down to create a specific type of gear. In this case, I'm using the simple double helical gear. And then here are the values. Um, do you want it to be double helical? I do. And then the module, this is how thick you want your teeth to be essentially. So I go with one millimeter. That tends to be, it tends to print out pretty good uh, for like a stock 3D printer nozzle. And then the number of teeth is, is something that you really have to consider. Um, for this gear, the number of teeth is actually the Z. So Z equals 30. So for here I had 30 teeth and uh, M is like the module size. That's like the section size in my head. So that's why I have it set to one. Number of teeth is 30. And then the gear height, how tall is your gear? Um, I put, what did I put? I guess I put 10 because it's not showing up here. So that's one of the values that doesn't get shown up. Uh, the pressure angle is, um, I just leave that at 14.5. And then for the helical angle, you could put like 45 degrees, but I put 30 degrees. I just felt like 30 degrees would be less aggressive on the 3D printer. You could do 45, but I went with 30. And uh, those are the values that I use. You can see here, HA, helical angle. Yeah, so that's how I got that going. Um, so it's nice that uh, you have at least some sort of reference of what values were used, and that just gets saved. You can always hide that. Um, an another thing that I kind of don't like about this is that you can't really define a diameter. Like the, the number of teeth is what defines your diameter. So trying to figure out the diameter um, for the internal gear, the gear ring, was difficult. Um, if you look at my timeline, I, the first one I tried was 120 teeth. So I just kept playing around with different numbers until I got a dimension that was like big enough to encapsulate to to fit a gear because you can see the body of the gear is fairly large so i needed to figure out okay well how if i'm going to fit this gear if i'm going to fit this motor inside the gear the gear needs to be x amount of diameter and that's how i was able to figure that out so i just kept punching in numbers and generating different gears and seeing what that uh diameter was and one way to find out what the diameter is of your of your kind of gear you can click on one of these lines here. You can see at the bottom it says length. Try a different one, maybe this surface. Nope, let me try this external surface. Yep, radius. Hit I on that for uh, inspect or measure. And you can see the diameter is 87.5. So that's that. You can always click on one of these faces and it'll give you a, a radius and then a diameter if you hit I on your keyboard for inspect. Um, yeah. Uh, so the way the external gears are made is similarly, they give you a sketch and it tells you uh, the radial thickness if you're doing an internal one, how many teeth, what's your angle. So if you're doing a, a gear system where you're doing a, you know, an internal gear and a regular gear, you just want to make sure that your helical angle is the same, your module is the same, and that's it really. Um, the radial thickness is just how thick you want your ring to be. I just put three millimeters. It, it, it does some weird math stuff here where it adds all these zeros, but that doesn't really matter. In this case, it ends up being the, a pretty, a pretty um, even radius here. You can see the diameter is 98, which is uh, the magic number there. And then once you generate it, you can do all sorts of um, you know, features uh, to make your gear have extra features. Here is a look at the very first top. So the very first top, I had the gear, the internal gear built into the top cover. And I showed you kind of why, you know, because then I'd have to print all of this again and creating one gear. There's a lot of movements that your printer has to do, a lot of G code, big files. So that's why I figured that. Ah, let me just make the top cover not have a gear and just make this, you know, internal thing have a little bit of a registration and key so you can slot it into uh, into the top cover. Um, so that's that's why I made it separate. Cool. Let's see, what is some other stuff about the gear? Um, I found uh, a, a bit of a tip here for my for the the gear for the actual motor. 
I reduced the top and the bottom height to about a millimeter. So it's two millimeters shorter than the internal gear. And that's because when you're printing and this is like the top surface or the bottom surface, your printer will tend to just kind of expand. And what I found is um, sometimes you'll have to clean these teeth up. And I found that you, you'll, you'll, you'll end up cleaning less if your gear is shorter than your internal gear because you're not having to worry about uh, the surface is mating. You know what I mean? So that's kind of what I found. Um, I ended up cleaning this up a little bit, um, but maybe we could add chamfers to these teeth so that you know your printer isn't printing this on the first layer because getting this to print on the first layer can be quite difficult because they're very, very short profile things. They're about a millimeter you know, in size. So that's why they're kind of difficult to print. And um, another reason to make your gears external is to print them very slowly so that you print really nicely. And uh, you don't have to worry about printing um, this massive assembly and then your gear ends up not working. So I, that's why I, I made the gears separate. So that's kind of a fun tip. Okay, what's another thing I could talk about? Um, I talked about the, uh, the gears. <laughs> That's really the main thing I talked about in assembly context. Um, let's talk about like the, the sensor here for, um, for tracking um, which, which frame it's on. So this is a photo interrupter and it has a, a T-slot body. And because of the size, I figured it'd be best to have it on the outside. But if you look on the inside here, I probably could have figured out a way to mount the photo interrupter inside of the case so you wouldn't see it. And then you could probably bring these notches uh, on the inside so that you wouldn't actually see it and it would look much cleaner. But what I thought about, the more I thought about that, the more I thought, well, I'm going to film how this is working. And if you have your sensor accessible, rather viewable, you get a better idea of what it looks like. So I figured out, let's not have it hidden inside the case. Let's break it out so you can actually see it. And when I'm filming it, you can see how it's working, how the sensor is keeping track of the frames. It has these, these little notches. They're passing through the IR LED. There's an LED in here. And whenever this passes through it, it's able to track that. It's able to sense that. And um, if that was on the inside, how the hell would I show that? <laughs> I guess I would show it through CAD, but I didn't want to. So that's kind of a, a thing about thinking about like, what is the goal and what is the use here? Is it, you know, so, so you have to kind of think about like, is it better to show it or hide it? And in this case, for this project, for this assembly, it made sense to have it on the outside. It actually makes the assembly easier too. Cause like, hey, there's some screws. I know where it is. I can access it. And yeah, so that's cool. So that's kind of the thinking behind that. And you're probably wondering, well, where's the, the cricket and the feather? Well, I made that uh, decision to have everything kind of flow outside of this little wire hole. So the idea is that the top ring, you'd have your wiring all kind of go through this center ring and uh, they all get routed through here. And then my cricket board just gets mounted externally. So I didn't even want to worry about that. So that's kind of a good thing. Let's say you want to use a different motor driver or something. You don't have to worry about mounting the electronics inside of this base plate. Speaking of the base plate, you'll notice these giant holes in the in the uh, in the bottom here in the opening. Why are those holes there? Well, two things: um, you save material and you save print time, and that's really the main thing. Is uh, if you have a lot of area and you're not using it, just cut it out, and you will save a lot of printing time. So the, with these holes, with these four holes here, I save about an hour and a half of printing time, and the base plate itself is about two millimeters thick. So yeah. Uh, it doesn't really reduce any of the rigidity of it. Um, and you're wondering, well, isn't light going to leak out of here since you need to encapsulate all the light? Not really. The light doesn't leak too much. There's, where is the light? The light's in this little red thing here. And yeah, the light points up. So it's not really, you know, there's not really much light leaking out from the bottom. So there's nothing to worry about there. One thing I guess I didn't show yet is like the internal ring. Right, so this is what holds the top cover up. So you have this this bit of a frame, and then at the top there you have this uh, 
let me hide the top cover where are you there you are yeah and let me hide the analysis there let me hide the ring there so there's just the top cover i mean the internal ring uh, the internal ring has these tabs that get secured with hex nuts and, and screws. It gets secured to the to the base plate itself. Uh, the ring is, I don't know, 20 millimeters tall, 24 millimeters tall. And it just, there's this little groove here, right? This has about 2.4 millimeters of clearance. I added these chamfers here to minimize um, the surface area that the lip will touch, the lip from the top cover. So let me hide um, a lot of the things so you can get a good look at just the things I want you to look at. So give me a second while I sort out my components here. All right, so the top is right over here. There you go, that's a better look at that. Maybe bring back the gear. There you go. All right, and I can do section analysis there. So there you can see how how these things are mating there. Yeah, so you have a good amount of clearance between these surfaces, right? About half a millimeter. And um, I, I made it, I made that channel a little bit bigger because I wasn't sure how much clearance I needed. It turns out that was a good amount of clearance. There's not much slop in there. Um, and because sometimes you get zits and things from the surfaces of just perimeters and no infill, um, the, um, having more clearance is, is a little bit better there. Um, so if you look at the underside, and let me turn off the bottom, you can get a look at the lip that I want to show you here. Come on. Here it is. Here's that lip. So the lip is ah, two millimeters tall. And this surface never touches um, the inner ring, if I'm not mistaken. Let me do a section analysis. Okay. Um, maybe it does. I'm seeing here that, yeah, maybe it does rest on it a little bit. But I think if I moved it up a little bit, um, I think it just barely touches it, which is, which is good because... Uh, yeah, you don't want the internal ring to touching the surface, but yeah, that's uh, that's how to minimize the friction there. Is just to have as little surface uh, area touching as you can, and there's no ball bearings or anything here. It's just a ring. <laughs> that's it. Um, yeah, and one one kind of advice thing I did add a little bit of lubricant to the groove, and that really did help a lot. It reduced a lot of the friction. Also, you can use a deburring tool. Uh, you can sand it down too if you want a really really nice. I think I did that too a little bit of light sanding or something um, And that reduced a ton of friction and it made it really quiet, too um, Yeah, but that's kind of the main things I want to talk about this again. It's the uh, first time using uh, assembly contextuals um, Which is really new to me. So I'm still kind of learning that um, It's 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 slightly parametric. I don't think I have too many per and I have none <laughs> I think some of the pieces have parameters, but other ones are, are not. Um, yeah, because you really kind of want to hard code this for what your parts that you're building for. Um, yeah, so I don't think you want to make it any bigger. The only parametric things that are kind of editable, I guess, are the slots. Like you can change that number of slots to something else if you have another animation that you want to do. All uh, right, now you can see here it's actually 20 uh, slots. And in the learn guide, uh, I made it 10 because there's only 10 frames of the party pair animation. Um, but I think you can add up to 24 max. And if you want to add any more than that, you're just gonna have to make the whole thing bigger, which is doable as well, depending on the size of your printer. But those are some fun tips uh, for doing um, internal gear mechanisms, turntables, anything like that. Um, I think this is a good uh, method. Don't forget uh, to check out the gear plugin it's called gf gear generator if you have another gear plugin that you think is better than this one maybe that's like editable uh, after the fact of building it let me know i'd love to try out other gear generators that'd be really cool also don't forget about the cricket feather wing you can get the cricket feather wing with your back in stock if you sign up to get notified or you can purchase it from one of their 
reseller distributors like DigiKey. Also have the learn guide for you if you want to download this uh, Fusion 360 uh, assembly, you can do so. Um, we also have a lot of the uh, parts and, and PCBs available to download as well in our GitHub repo, which I'll have linked in the description of this video. That's going to do it for this one, folks. Good luck with all your maker endeavors. But until next time, remember to make a great day. Bye, folks. I'll do my party parrot impersonation.